Good Monday morning. It is the Flow Track Podcast. My name is Lincoln Shrike, joined today by Gordon Mack. It's June 1st. You can email our show, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. Gordon, how are you doing today? We made it to June. It is weird. Mm-hmm. When I woke up this morning, seeing June 1st on the radio clock, I was like, whoa. It still feels like March was last week when mm-hmm. <laughs> the whole world was getting shut down for everything. But man, June. Before we know, I know. July. We'd be gearing up for this would be the that kind of fun two week period typically between uh regionals or prelims for NCAA outdoor track and field and and nationals. It's always a fun time to kind of figure out who looked good and and you know who's who's maybe a sleeper to to surprise at nationals. Of course, we don't have that this year. It's a really, it's something I, I really miss this time of year in, in track. The pro season starts to get ramping up, but 2020, that was uh, just not in the cards. Yes, it wasn't. We could have had Prefontaine coming up, right? Mm-hmm. The pre-classic, uh, going to the Portland Track Festival, but all those meets don't exist. There, are, Some of them got postponed to potentially August. We don't know what will happen with mm-hmm. the Diamond League season. They did reschedule for everything to start mid-August. Uh, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. You know, the NBA announced that most they're like 99% sure they're going to start July 31st in a bubble format. Can Diamond League do bubbles where they control <laughs> everyone who's in and out of the stadium? I don't know. I mean, they can easily Probably have a track meet without fans. They could do a track yeah. meet without fans because, let's be honest, track athletes have been doing track meets without fans their entire lives, so there won't be anything new there. But uh, we'll see. We'll see how it is. The The deaths have been going down, which is a good thing, but you never know mm-hmm. what's going to happen later in the summer. So we'll see. Yeah. The uh, track meets without fans at the professional level, they got a good trial run at Doha. The uh the days without good distance running or or Mutaz Essabarshim were pretty lightly attended. So I, I don't know if they can do the bubble, but no fans yet. Yeah, you're right. It, it's a joke we've seen since the beginning of March. I think when this all started to happen was, oh, track will be fine. There's no – people are used to having no fans. So, uh, but, but but unfortunately, that's, that's kind of true. Okay, so on today's show, uh, of course, we're just a track and field – podcast but it's kind of hard to have a show talking about current events without unfortunately talking about all the protests that are that are going on nationwide uh in response to the killing of george floyd in minneapolis uh track athletes have been black american track athletes have been talking about their experiences and kind of the conflict that they feel as athletes who represent the country and i think they have kind of a unique position because they do put that usa on the chest but they still, you know, experience the racism that is unfortunately present in our country. And now it's all seemingly coming to a head in response to this killing in Minneapolis. So we will talk about what they have said, everybody from Bernard Lagat to Noah Lyles to Allison Felix. <clears throat> a lot of athletes, you know, coming forward with their stories and 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 sharing what they've gone through. And so we'll discuss that. We'll also look at the Blue Jean Mile World Record, which went down on Saturday in what I believe New York, Johnny Gregoric, 406. Uh, and also Morgan McDonald in lighter news joins Joe Bossard's group in Boulder. Gordon, you want to start with uh the the just to knock it out of the way, the the blue jeans the blue jean mile world world record. Did you watch Johnny Gregoric run 406? I did. I watched it live, and it was kind of cool. There were a lot of professional athletes who also were watching it live on the the Instagram. You see, like Molly Huddle, Nikki Hilt, all like cheering them on. Uh, the previous world record was four eleven. I'm not sure who held it. I'm not sure how this became a world record. It was thing. Dylan Maggard. Uh, it was Dylan Maggard. Oh Maggard. Okay, so he started it. Yeah. Uh, so four oh six. Uh, so he was paced a thousand meters, which is you know pretty good. He went out, I think, in like two oh three through eight hundred. But the whole purpose of the whole event wasn't just like, hey, it's quarantine. Let's run a Blue Jean Mile. Uh, it yeah. actually had a good cause behind it. It was for mental health awareness, uh, trying to raise some money. Uh, and you could tell that, you know, it wasn't really about running a Blue Jean Mile. It's more about kind of bringing awareness to mental illness, which has affected the Gugork family. Uh, uh, I believe, I think his brother passed away um, because of mental illness. So, like, it's... it's in that, in his, 
Uh, so for him to kind of spend the last month kind of trying to raise money and train for something that's so kind of unique and weird, like a blue jean mile that normally you wouldn't be able to do in June, right? Right now he'd be training to try to run a fast mm -hmm. time at Prefontaine, right? So he has this unique opportunity to take, make the best of the moment. Uh, and it was kind of cool. There were people out there cheering him on. His parents were there. Uh, 406, it made Sports Center, which is pretty cool. The Dead. whole clip made Sports Center. Uh, and I think Emma Bates ran a, a Jorts 10K uh, on the other side of the country, oh, nice. which is kind of cool. I'm not sure how fast she ran, but she decided to dome the, the, the blue jean era and try to break the 10K Jorts record which I think no matter what she did was going to be a record because I don't think that's ever been attempted. But hey, <laughs> we're seeing a new world. You know, we had, yeah. you know, the beer mile was a big thing in 2014. Uh, now or now we're going to bring in the blue jean era where everyone's going to start running some blue jean records. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple notable things. He Gregoric on his side was raising money for the National Alliance for Men Mental Health, I believe, or it the – the acronym is NAMI, so something along that. But yes, uh, as you mentioned, he lost his brother a little over a year ago. And on on his spikes, ASICs had stitched in his brother's name, Patty, and uh, NAMI on the other foot. They raised over $30,000. I think their goal was much, much smaller to begin with, in the, not, not, in the, uh, not at all in the five figures. So they absolutely blew their goal out of the water. And I know this was something that was really important to the, excuse me, the Gregoric family. His dad was there. His mom was there. I think they both, they both ran. So, I mean, good on him. Not, not only the time, it wouldn't have really mattered what the time was, um, but 406 on its own, even without all the special uh, things that this was benefiting 406 and running in blue jeans is incredible. It's, it's, I don't know that, that record may stay for a while. Like that's, that's pretty fast in blue jeans. I, I got to wonder if the chaffage was was an issue here. Uh, but what a what a way to honor his brother's legacy and to bring awareness to <clears throat> to mental health. And uh, gosh, thirty thousand dollars, pretty solid chunk of change to to raise for for Nami. Not gonna lie, this could be the start to those some big controversies down the road where people start using when Nike gets involved and they start making their version of the blue jeans mm -hmm. where you're mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm not sure these are truly blue jeans. Are they they're a lot right. more worn in and loose? They're more like blue sweatpants. Right. Uh, so right. we can enjoy it now, but you know, 10 years from now, the, the blue jean world record is going to be like 349 mm -hmm. and everyone's going to be like, that's not a legitimate blue jean. They're going to have to have rules mm -hmm. and regulations. So it's all fine. I would put on, I would, yeah, I would support a full track meet if socially distanced and possible, where everybody is wearing blue jeans. You know, we've got sprinters in blue jeans, high jumpers in blue jeans. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what people's strategies are. Do you go skin tight or do you go loose like Johnny Gregoric? I think, you know, the distance runners, they need to be a little looser to get that full range of motion, at least as much as you can get. But it'd be interesting to see everyone's strategy. Do you go style? Because my man Johnny, I mean, I think he's very stylish, but I don't think style was his top priority there. He kind of they were looser and didn't really look like they fit as well. But they did give him that full range of motion. I would be in support of track and field going to this way to to having a full meet, if possible, in blue jeans. I just want, I just want to see Levi's is a title sponsor. Yeah, yeah, I want to see some big ass uh, shot putters just wearing blue jean overalls and no shirt. They're, That's all they have. So it looks like some like hundred percent country. It's a weird <laughs> fantasy, but I I share in that. I share in wanting to see Ryan Krauser with like a piece of grass in his mouth and uh, giant overalls and just going going for it. I'm I'm hundred so, percent there with you. So if you ever trained, uh, maybe starting chance, Google Vince Wilfork uh, overalls uh, barbecue. Vince Wilfork, the former football yes, player for the Patriots. Course. That's what I imagine. One of the bigger the humans on earth. Look like. That's what all the yeah, shop putters yeah. look like. Just enjoy living their best Absolutely. life. Absolutely. So yeah. We, all right. So we'll work so, on that. We'll work on the blue jean track meet uh, coming soon in 2034. <laughs> coming soon. All right. To moving on to a definitely much more serious topic. Uh, as we mentioned at the top, track athletes have been responding on social media to the 
active protests across the country, of course, people nationwide are protesting against mistreatment of black people, African Americans in the country who have, of course, experienced systematic racism for generations and generations. This was, of course, prompted by the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis uh, last week. I believe it was a week ago. But uh, it, I, I think track athletes in this country who are Olympians and represent the country at the international level have a unique perspective because they do put that red, white, and blue on their chest. And, and still yet, though, they feel the same, of course, the same pain of African-Americans across the country who are, haven't been as fortunate, but still even of athletes that are accomplished still experience that racism and they still feel that pain. And I just think it was important. It's important to point out uh, several several of their posts that I thought were really really pertinent. Um, and I'll just read a few here. Noah Lyles, of course, one of the most famous sprinters in the country. Uh, I want to read what he said in a, in a long Twitter post. He said, "Quote: It hurts my heart because as an athlete, I love running for my country. But as a human being, is disheartening to know that my people are being killed while I go out and win medals for them and try to make the U.S. look good." And then in a separate quote, all we are asking for is to not be killed. Um, it's as, as, as a white guy, I, I have this tendency to be, you, you look at it first and you want to kind of get defensive. And, and of course, I support rights for, for black people. And I, of course, I recognize that they're equal. And of course, I want them to have more opportunities. And of course, I don't want there to be police brutality, but we kind of have this 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 way about us of being like, oh, that I, I don't contribute to that. I'm not a part of that. I don't, I don't, um, I'm, I'm for black people having just the same amount of opportunities. But then you, this for me has had this moment and I'm sure other people have different opinions and that's fine. But this for me has been a time to like look internally and being like, how am I lifting up, you know, my black neighbors and my, my black friends and, and what am I doing to make sure that I'm not just taking, um, my privilege and relying on that and 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 I'm ensuring that I'm listening to not only what these athletes are saying but but to what all black people are saying and what they're going through and you really feel the pain when you read these athletes comments and uh, another one I wanted to to hype or to to read here Ashley Spencer uh, who said, who's of course an Olympian in the 400 meter hurdles and Olympic medalist. As an Olympian, I often feel like I proudly represent a country who hates people who look like me. It's heartbreaking. And and that, I mean, unfortunately, the, the actions of the country, it, it sometimes it, it, it just feels true. And it's, it's, it feels in, counterintuitive to say that because we look at these athletes and they're like, oh, you're so successful. There's no way you experience anything but black people experience racism black people of all you know all walks of life experience racism all the time and i think we're finally realizing that as a country and and listen people who are listening to this don't want to hear the opinions of white people not but i think right now what we're seeing is just it's important to listen to black people and that's that's really what i'm trying to instill in my house and and for my son who won't ever live through this, who won't ever experience racism just based on the color of his skin. I, I hope that, you know, those of us who are not in the black community are just taking time to listen. And I think being in the track community provides us that opportunity. We see these athletes and we know who they are and we know that they represent the country well, but then you've seen that they're going through persecution and they're going through a hard time. It really reinforces to me like the problems that our country have. So I, I'm thankful for all these athletes who have made made comments and talked about their experience. And I did want to read uh, one more, and then I'll read this entire one. It's from Bernard Lagat. Uh, he said, don't deny it. When I'm running on the trail passing you, I'm not a threat. Don't yell and scream and say, you know what I was going to do. I know what I'm doing. I'm on a trail running. If you feel threatened by a black man running, I'm not the problem. When I'm shopping for a car, don't direct me to the used car lot. Don't say in your own language, that's a nice car for a black man. Don't come up to me at the airport and assume I'm in the wrong line. Don't race towards me with weapons and say it's a random check. Don't clutch your purse when I pass you in the store aisle. Don't pretend you can't see me when you cut in front of me in a line. 
Don't tell me I shouldn't let my son wear a hoodie. Don't say you don't mean it that way. Don't make excuses. Stop racism. Don't deny it. So he said that uh, over the weekend on Instagram, uh, just some powerful words. And uh, you, you just, as like I said, as, as a white man with privilege, I don't think about somebody like four-time Olympian or however many time Olympian Bernard Lagat is. I was like, of course he doesn't experience that. It's not that 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 doesn't happen to him. There's no way he's he's privileged. He's an Olympian. He's he's beyond that. But no, this happens to black people of all, like I said, of all walks of life. And I I, I truly hope, even though you hate to see violence being inflicted no matter where it starts you know you don't want to see it you hope real change is is brought to to this and and that um african americans who do represent this country on the track and field level on the international and wear the red white and blue that they don't feel conflicted anymore and they feel comfortable wearing that uh that jersey on their chest and don't feel like it's a conflict of interest for them to re to represent the country a country that they see as causing harm to to uh, be at their family members or or um, other African Americans, so let's hope real change comes from these protests. Yeah, and uh, one, th a lot of times when uh, big moments like this happen, like this happened, uh, there was back in twenty fourteen, I believe, was it when like the Ferguson with yeah with Michael Brown protests happened, but then like even Trayvon Martin, like it, you know, it seems like every six months right there's a new like tragedy that occurs that gets national spotlight uh and a lot of times living in the working in the sports world a lot of times the people who represent like the the sports world perspective a lot of time are more a lot of times it's the nba athletes right because they're the most famous front-facing african-americans mm -hmm. that we have like football players are kind of hidden behind a helmet mask so you don't really see their faces as much and baseball players there's not as many african-americans it's more of a latino community uh and track athletes are normally you know talked about every four years right so mm -hmm. it is a lot of times when people look to to not say celebrities but athlete leaders in, our, in the community everyone wants to see what lebron james says or what you know Shaq or charles barkley and all these great icons say uh, and it is kind of refreshing to see what the African American community in the track world says, right? Because, you know, as a person who works in the in the in the in the track world as the media, I mean, track and field is a predominantly African American sport. I mean, cross country is a predominantly white sport, right? But when when you mm -hmm. extend it to track and field, like you look at Team USA, it is probably 80 to 85 percent african-american because you know our best athletes are african-american and they we kind of it's it's kind of it's it's kind of interesting how like i'm sorry what i trying to say it, i guess it was it's kind of it's it's one of those things where you kind of think about like when these social issues happen and there's voices you think like, oh, NBA is that sport, but really track and field is basically the same like the NBA. It is a predominantly African-American community of the best athletes in the world, all kind of selected to be within this, you know, the Team USA is the three best in every event. So they're the, the best of the best, the same way a, a basketball team is the best 15 players of the in the world. And it's just like, you don't, a lot of times you kind of, I mean, famous athletes kind of have like this weird thing where you kind of look at them as like kind of not a normal person because they're just mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you're just like an excellent athlete and you live like this excellent life. You're not part of the real world, right? You kind of separate them in this weird way because for an NBA, they're millionaires. And for track, you're like, well, no one else is as good as you. So you, you live in this like separate world. You live in this like elite athlete world that is no one else has to live in. Like you have the privilege of elite athlete which is just like not real. Like there are people too. They are, they grew up in a house. They were 10 years old, just like you were 10 years old. They were in high school, just the way you were in high school. You know, they, while maybe they live out of hotel rooms and they have more money than the average human being in, in the current situation, their life is more than just 
the current situation that they're in. Their life is like their entire experience. So it's great when someone like Bernard Lagat talks about like, hey, you. he said, if you feel threatened by black men running, it's not what you don't. If you know what, okay, don't yell and scream when you say, you know what I was going to do. I know what I'm going to do. I'm not, oh, I'm on a trail running. If you feel threatened by a black man running, I'm not the problem. Like, you would never think that Bernard, we, like, Bernard, like, God, he's like the, he's everyone's dad, right? No one, like, yeah. he's, 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 he's like, you just kind of paint this, like, he lives in this world of, like, everyone loves him. But in reality, you know, when behind closed doors, he has these moments, right? And it's kind of, it opens your eyes that, even the most successful in the African-American community got to deal with this. It's like, whoa, like, so it's not just a social economical thing. It's just like, you could, you know, don't matter if you're rich or poor, you, you, you're, you're treated the same way in, mm -hmm. uh, by negative people. Right. So I thought that yeah. was kind of eye opening. It's just refreshing, I guess, to know that this isn't a, a, one area of the community problem it, like it, it goes everywhere from rich to poor you know mm -hmm. yeah famous, and it is yeah. it, it, it's another thing it was a reminder of my privilege that i never considered that bernard lagat could be a victim of racism you know i never thought like you're like you said he's everybody's dad like he's 45 year old got happy-go-lucky guy who's always positive in the mix zone and you don't even consider um that somebody like him could be like I said, like I said, a victim of, of judgment based on the color of his skin. But then you realize of, well, of course, because every black person in this country and basically every black person worldwide has at some point experienced racism and, and experiences it on a regular basis. And, you know, just, I, I think for me, seeing the protests and reading the words and, and really, really feeling the pain. And, you know, I would encourage people to, listen to what's being shared the videos you know listening to the to the words i think for me like just looking at the images is you kind of get into this catatonic state where you just like look at fire and you look at angry people and it's kind of scary but to me i was listening to uh, a eight minute speech that killer mike gave in in atlanta killer mike the rapper and it was very powerful and very moving to me and there is a certain helplessness that which i mean i'm fine with like where i'm like what what can i do like what can i and and i and i think it's 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 looking inside and realizing my own privilege and realizing that i've never had to deal with this and just lifting up you know my black neighbors and people in the community that have that experience this all the time and realize that my life has been so infinitely easier based on the color of my skin and that's unfortunate and that's wrong and uh now's the time to kind of to kind of give back and 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 realize and and support listen if you uh, this isn't we're not trying to be political it's just trying to help help black people feel like they have a place in this country and you know i'm not I understand that some people are going to view certain things as saying that black people deserve to have equal rights as, as controversial, but I, I don't really have time for that. You know, I don't want to listen to, to that argument. This is just more about fair treatment. And if you support track and field and you support our Olympians, listen to what they're saying. They're not just saying this for attention. You know, Bernard the God's not just getting out there and saying that, that he he was judged just to, because he wants more likes on his Instagram page. This is real pain, and you know Noah Lyle said it as well. Ashley Spencer, uh, you know, I encourage you to if you follow these athletes to read what they're saying because it, it really was an important thing for me. Because obviously, I don't consider myself racist, and I I don't I don't feel like I've done anything to harm black people in my life. But you, you it's incidental in this country you can't avoid it i mean i've been lifted up where black people have been put down i've gotten jobs over i'm sure over black people that that i was either less qualified for or you know i my my life is infinitely easier by the color of my skin and and, and i hope this is the reckoning that that starts to to mend that uh both in sports and and of course just in in normal life as well it's it's been it's been too long and uh a lot of people are hurting right now and i hope everyone stays safe in the protests um and i hope the cops in minneapolis pay for what they did and uh yeah 
I can't really say much more about that. I'm obviously not the expert. We're not the experts as two white guys. We've never experienced that oppression. But listen, if you, you want to look at it from a track and field angle, like read what the athletes are saying, hear what hear the words that they're they're speaking. And, and I think it'll shed some light, some understanding onto what's going on right now in the country and what people experience all the time. One uh, post that I, because uh, obviously everyone's posting a lot of posts and I follow um, Nick Foles, of course, former Eagles great quarterback who won me a Super Bowl. Got, he's forever <laughs> going to be the greatest player of all time. <laughs> but uh, he's he's a he's a, a good follow. I read his book and all this stuff. But he kind of talked about like when he talks about when he won the Super Bowl, how everyone will think about oh backup quarterback winning Super Bowl or running the Philly special, which is the play he did to throw a touchdown in the Super Bowl. But he says like what was really great about that team wasn't that we won a Super Bowl, wasn't that we were really talented. It was the idea that a bunch of people from very different backgrounds all had a same vision and became like virtual brothers. They became a brotherhood, you know, because if you think about it, a football team, it you know, you have a white kicker or a white quarterback who probably comes from like a rich background. Then you have, you know, the star running back made come from an inner city and you just have a very diverse, eclectic group of people all with the same goal, all coming from different backgrounds, and they all are really good at their role that they provide, right? They're really, I'm really good at being a defensive lineman, or I'm really good at being a running back or quarterback. And they all don't think about, like, they all just, like, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a w interesting dynamic. Like a football locker room, you know, I, it's, I was saying it's kind of like a track and field locker room when you think about, it. you know, track has a very different, like, you know, the, you have the throwers who are kind of coming from a, a different perspective, maybe physically they're not really the, the skinny type, right? And then you also have the the like just race. I mean, a lot of African Americans are drawn towards the sprint events, and a lot of Caucasians are drawn more towards the distance events. Sometimes there's some crossover. Normally that hits around 800, where it's kind of 50 50. Uh, but they kind of have their own training. They kind of do their own thing. But in the end of the day, they both wear the same jersey of whatever their track team is. They do different workouts every day. But then on Saturday during that track meet, they all are kind of cheering for each other. And, you know, the distance team is watching that four by one, hoping they win. You know, the, you know, everyone is watching the four by four together. Like it's, it's something kind of cool where like, I think watching a four by four in general is like that moment where like, the throwers come from a different background, sprinters, distance runners. They all want their four by four to win. And even though none of them are like doing the same training or have the same groups of friends, they kind of all just have the same goal. It's like, hey, we're a team. And I think a lot of that can be extrapolated to like the real world, right? Everyone comes from a different background. People are raised differently. People are raised in the middle of Omaha, Nebraska. Some people are raised in Philadelphia, you know, inner city, some people raised in the suburbs, right? But when we all come from these different backgrounds and we live these different lives for the first 18 years of our lives, and then when we're supposed to live in the real world as adults, you got to recognize that, man. You got to recognize that like, hey, we all are just different, but we all have the same goal. We all just want, you know, you could say mm -hmm. happiness, world peace and be cheesy. But in the, in the end, you just kind of want, you want uh, to just be treated the way you... You want to be treated. The, you want to treat others the way you want to be treated, right? Yeah. You, know? you don't yeah. want people judging you, so you just, in order to do that, you don't judge someone back, right? But I think it's cool analogy in sports, especially on a football team and a track team, to show how people with differences can have unity. Which is I think yeah, America is a super diverse, different type country, right? You know, people and, who are f first year immigrants versus people who've been here for forever or whatever, you know. Yeah. And of course, as you know, using the sports analogy, I think the reckoning we're coming to and, and we've known this is that if it, if it is like a sport, you know, the game has been rigged and the refs are if the reps are the cops, they're they're treating the, the black athletes different than they are the white athletes and they're getting unfairly penalized and, and, and all that. And that's, you know, maybe a conversation for, for a different show here, but you hope for institutional change. It's I think. We're, we're beyond like, oh, we got to treat everybody the same. We're, we're like, that hasn't worked. Like there need to be different laws and there need to be police officers who are held accountable. So um, I know some people are going to disagree. That's just my opinion. But I, I, I think we can all agree that that 
black people have been unfairly treated and need to be treated with the same amount of respect that that us white people have been treated with and that requires not just saying it but actually making some real changes to the way we uh govern the way we uh enforce laws um and the way police officers you know make decisions it's because it's it's broken right now okay um not a lot of news, of course, going on in the track world. Uh, there's not a ton of events. I mean, we've had a few had a few races. We had the Ingerbritsons. We had the sub four by the high schooler. Um, we got we're going to have the impossible games coming up. Um, but the momentum is still a little stalled with like real track coming back. Hope for the Diamond League in August and beyond. Uh, but one little tiny l- bit of news that we haven't gotten to yet. Morgan McDonald leaving Wisconsin to go train under Joe Bossard's group in Boulder. Kind of a surprise to me. You think of that group, of course, as, you know, Emma Coburn's team. It's her husband who's the coach. And, you know, they just got Danny Jones and they have a bunch of other female athletes. I I feel like this isn't their first male athlete, but is there is there another male runner on Joe Bossard's group? Yeah, Nick Harris, who was third in that 1500. Uh, Se- second no he was second second oh second uh and then i think there's beat Craig other... yeah okay there's someone else too i forget well were you surprised by this move by McDonald's? i was i i thought it was like maybe it's the start of others to join right i was thinking does this mean joe klecker i mean i join? feel like that's obvious right that's odd that right? feels so that that's gonna happen i almost feel because that would work because yeah they, that makes they sense. could train together but they don't have to compete because they're different nationalities so it kind of works out where they both can make teams. They're not competing for it at the same team spot. And then maybe, I mean, you need that that one. You need that one big horse, right? Like that to like kind of start the momentum. I mean, look, think of the Bowerman Track Club women, right? They were all men for a long time. They had a couple of women that, but none of them were like, uh, you know. But then Shalane Flanagan was like the, yeah. we're doing it, right? And then everyone started coming. And now look mm-hmm. at them like people forget. It's kind of crazy to think that four years ago, there were like no, there was like one woman on the Bowerman track club to go from like one woman to like the best, not just in the country, but in the world is like wild. And I think mm-hmm. Morgan McDonald can be like that first. I mean, again, he's not the first at other men there, but he could be that one who's like, I'm making world teams consistently. You guys want to make world teams with me? Come join. And I mean, training works both ways, right? You can, you, I mean, you just make the paces a little faster for the men, and you're off, you're <laughs> off and running, right? So, typically, yeah. that it, you you can t- coach men just as well uh, as you can coach women, and vice vice versa. Of course, there's some separate, d- there's some differences, but but yes, I would have all the faith that, with given the success Joe Bossard's had with with not only his wife but you know dom scott and now he's got danny jones and Corey mcgee and aisha prod i mean there's some been some good runners that have run fast times and obviously emma coburn's won medals uh and won gold um does under the tutelage of name yet uh, i mean they they go by team boss they just gotta they just I think I saw on social media that they uh, commissioned a mural and it was, it said team boss. So, I mean, it's gotta be team boss, right? I mean, that, that, that makes tons of sense. Yeah. They got a, uh, like a week ago or so they, uh, they got a, like, looks like a mural commissioned and it just says team boss. Pretty cool. I like the colors like pink, orange, some purple. It's check it out. Emma Coburn's. It's, it's on okay it's on emma coburn's uh instagram so uh but i i gotta think that's that's gonna be the name but this is uh this is gonna turn into to quite okay. the group here uh they also have hold on let's see oh there's morgan mcdonald yeah so he's let's see they are uh, yeah her, her latest posts emma coburn they're in crested butte and they've got Nick Harris, who looks like an outlaw because he's got a like a bandana. They got Morgan <laughs> yeah. McDonald. Uh Trip Hurt, which I mean, if you're gonna that's have the other guy, yeah. Yeah, Trip Hurt, that that that's a solid uh, name addition to the to this group. So it's a growing team, and you got their two latest additions 
Danny Jones and Morgan McDonald, not bad. Not bad at all. I could absolutely see Klecker becoming a part of this. We don't know that, but it just makes too much sense. Um, coming from Colorado, you, you know, and just you're just going leaving the university to just go train with a separate group in Boulder, but it's you're staying in the same city. That that makes all the sense in the world. It's a it's definitely a group. It'll be interesting. I know they have different sponsors, but see if they end up in end up eventually picking up a, a team sponsor. I know that they have athletes, you know, from Emma, who's New Balance, and Aisha Prod, who's Under Armour, Morgan Under Armour, and they've got other other athletes that are uh, sponsored otherwise. But, you know, does this eventually become like a big group, like a Bowerman? It seems like it's got that momentum. Yeah, and uh, it'll be interesting if there ever is like a big, like – I mean, it's going to be hard, right? Because a lot of these Under Armour athletes are kind of newly signed for their contract to expire. It kind of takes, you know, the deal with that member when Ho when NA's, not, not NZ, uh, New Jersey, New York Track Club did the Hoka thing. They still had some like grandfathered in non Hoka athletes. Yeah. So they, maybe they do it that way. And then it's like, okay, every time you're a new one, you, you, get that, you get the athlete sponsorship. But they have Adidas, Under Armour, New Balance all represented there. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I kind of I want it'll be awesome if like it becomes very good and we can start seeing some, you know, because now that we don't have NOP anymore, right? Maybe because we had like NOP versus Bowerman, that was like the thing. We don't have that. Maybe it can be now Team Boss versus Bowerman, uh, especially the fact that you know, especially in the women's steeple, right, where you got Coburn versus Quigley and Furyx. You know, did you see yeah. the? Did you see the? The the troll that someone did to redirect Emma Coburn's website from ColinQuigley.com. I did, yeah, I did. And I the uh, I know Emma Coburn was upset by it and didn't take it as a joke. Obviously, she wasn't behind it, but uh, I think it's funny. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> she didn't think it's funny, so I don't want to make it too light of it. But I mean, that is kind of a funny joke. But I I can understand from her perspective that she wanted to make sure people knew that that that's not like she was trying to troll her a u.s teammate in the steeplechase or, any, or anything like like that um is hey, why I calling a u.s teammate they're rival they're 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 not on the same team they're on different teams they oh god beat sorry sorry yeah i know but i don't think messing with each other's brands is the best way to go about that but i that's not what happened who knows who did that it's definitely uh it's I, I know you didn't do it, but it's definitely a joke uh, in the vein of something that you would do. So she did it that it? there's other Gordon Max out there who would who would switch up somebody's URL and and redirect it to. First off, I now I, now I'm curious. I haven't actually done this. Does this still? It's still there. Well, you just bought someone bought the Colin Quigley URL and then auto redirected it to Emma Coburn. I mean the way. Emma could get around yeah. it. I'm sure there's a way you can probably prevent viewers from a certain website to come. I don't know if you can do that. I'm not sure if it's possible, but mm. whatever. Hey, I, I'm sure Colleen didn't care. I'm sure Emma like texted Colleen saying like, hey, I didn't do that. And she probably was like, yeah, it was probably yeah. some kid on the internet. Whatever. Let's wow. pretend Emma to fight. Emma has a pretty established her. website. She's got yeah. like recipes and I was hoping recipes. that they're also CourtneyFurex.com would redirect, Did but do it, Courtney already had. She already has a website. So, does everybody have websites? I know. Like, what what do people do with these websites? I mean, they sell. She's selling. Emma, Emma Coburn has many resistance bands, mobility ball. She's got like her own brand going. She's got a phone grip. Dang, Team Boss Camelback. Care. They, listen, uh, Tenman kind of set the tone for you know mobilizing a brand and now these athletes i think are following suit i don't know what came first emma coburn's gear or tenman but got to make that extra cash you gotta have a side hustle and uh you know i guess especially in times like these when there's no place there's no place to get prize money right now so you might as well find right. other sources of revenue i mean Hope. that's what nick yeah. simmons was was king of doing that right he was always yeah. trying to find new ways to like increase his brand find other ways and I think you could look at Nick Simmons kind of as like the, what's the word, the trendsetter or the sure, whatever yeah. the first. What what do you call the first to do something? The mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to. it's on the tip of my tongue, but um, I don't I don't know. I know what you're saying. Trendsetter's fine. We can go with that. Yeah. But uh, now Tinman obviously is 
I mean, Timmons is definitely making more money on their brand than they do in prize money or the contracts, mm-hmm. right? Outside of Drew Hunter, right? They're they're right. living off of they don't need a they're making they're not asking for a sponsor to give them money. They're they're asking for their fans, which is, you know, I guess the right move, right? Because that's how you make that's how you that's how you keep a living in in a weird sport mm-hmm. where it's not that big economically. You gotta find other it, means of income. if you if you were gonna sell gear, would you sell backwards hats? Like that seems to be your signature look. <clears throat> That's yeah, yeah. But it's just it's, there's no there's no uh th- yeah. It'll just what is that my thing? Backwards hats? Is that no? I just wear yeah, backwards you... hat because we filmed this podcast in the morning, mm-hmm. and I bad hair in the morning, and I'm not try- about to try to look like a a bum because yeah. I wake up probably like me five minutes before we start recording. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to look like you. I wake yeah, up. Every, I know. I understand that. Every podcast, I'm five five minutes of awake before we start recording. So mm, no, I, I know. Put a hat to kind of cover uh, it up. If I had merch, I think I would sell like ratty hoodies with just like like famous flow track quotes I've said over the years. Like, did I just see what I just saw? I think that'd be a big market for that. Like famous, uh, meaningless quotes that just highlight my stupidity. That's what I would do. Maybe I'll start doing that. As you know from when we were in the office, I like to make shirts that are kind of meaningless or have random quotes that no one understands. So if I was going to have, maybe I can hack through and I get ColleenQuigley.com and Emma Coburn to direct to my Patreon, which I haven't set up yet. And people will be thinking they're sending money to those athletes, but instead they're buying my ratty hoodies. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. You can start a ratty hoodie business. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like the idea. Let's do it. Start a ratty Especially hoodie. Especially right business. now. I mean, people are wearing. I mean, I wear this blue hoodie. This is like, this is my outfit. This and I have this these like giant pair of Nike shorts from like middle school that I still wear. It's kind of my outfit these days, you know. Here's a question you can answer honestly. When's the last time you put on pants? Yeah. Well, I mean. It, <laughs> Do you do short like nicer shorts count? Because I have no, been wearing those pants. occasionally. Pants? pants. I don't know. No, I honestly can't remember. Now, part of that I will say. Now, of course, of course, a big part of that is because we're not going to the office or going really anywhere in public, of which those are needed. But part of that is also for the last month and a half, it's been kind of too hot for pants. So there's that. But yeah, it's been a while. I haven't. So I moved in mid-April, and my jeans haven't come out of the dresser. So there's that's that's for sure i've not worn pants uh in recent enough times for me to remember so what about, what about you have you once last time you worn a belt uh, yeah i wore a belt some of my shorts are still still yet a little uh, they require a, a belt loose. so I, i've worn a belt in recent times in the last month but few and far between i'm, I'm going more of the waistband these days you know the uh, elastic is, waistband man. yeah it's a good it's a good vibe for me um it's kind of just fits it it's gonna be weird going back and like wearing i don't know like a presentable clothing i are are you uh are you gonna be going back to the office anytime soon uh i think so yeah uh i mean they're opening it i know that you and kevin probably aren't so i might just be by myself yeah listen i'm trying uh, to i'm trying to make a resolution this yeah i want to do the podcast in person Oh, yeah. I could maybe get behind that in a little bit. I'm trying to be nicer. I know I've been judgmental of people who have been, you know, loosening their social distancing measures. And I know the rules are lightening up a little bit, but I'm trying to bring back the judgment and just, you know, hope for the best. I think my heart was in the right place, but I think I was a little bit too extreme. I will not be going to the office anytime probably soon. My wife's pregnant and it's important for everyone not to get COVID, not just, you know, people who are have kids, young kids or pregnant wives, but trying to be less judgmental so that's fine if you if you want to go in the office that's fine just pick me up a uh, a beer and something from snack nation and uh i'll be all good to go will do will do <laughs> we have a great guest on the pod tomorrow we'll leave that a secret oh, yeah. good pod mm-hmm. good, good pod tomorrow very good pod kind yeah of, i'm also excited kind of topical wasn't planning on it being topical but it's kind of topical with uh some news that we haven't hit we have there's been other news that we didn't talk about we'll talk about it on that podcast mm-hmm. tomorrow uh but yeah we'll keep it a surprise so you'll look at your phone and be like "Ooh, i'm gonna listen to that it's gonna be a good one i, I haven't done it Hopefully. we haven't f- recorded but it's guaranteed to be a, it's gonna be a banger it's gonna be good mm-hmm. 
exciting, exciting things to come this week. All right, that'll do it for us today on the June 1st edition of the Flow Track Podcast. Reminder, you can email us, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. Find us on any app. I'm pretty sure we're on any app where you listen to podcasts or you can watch our faces on flowtrack.com. We'll talk to you tomorrow.